Let us now proceed with the second part, which is called the Osebel's theory. And of course, Osebel's theory was proposed by a theorist, and his name is David Paul Osebel. David Paul Osebel, according to the screen, please read this. Uh, Miss uh, Sophia, please read. Who is David Paul? Let us look at his profile. Sophia. Yes, sir. David Paul Ausibel, as an American psychologist, born in Brooklyn, New York. Did his undergraduate work at the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania pre pre med pre med and psychology. Graduate graduated from medical school at Middlesex. Middlesex University. Middlesex University. And PH. PhD? PhD. PhD in Developmental Psychology at Cambodia University. Columbia. Influence Columbia University. Influenced by the by the work of PJ. PJ. <laughs> okay, so PJ is of course another psychology or psychologist or another theorist uh, for uh, his uh, theory, of course. So let us look at David Paul Osebel's or the Osebel's theory. So what is Osebel's theory number one? Okay, the most important factor influencing learning is quantity. Oh, how much you are going to give, the clarity, of course, it must be clear, and the organization of the learner's present knowledge and pres present knowledge. So meaning, uh, according to the Osible's theory, in order for the students to learn, there must have enough quantity, how much is to be given to your students. Because uh, what uh, you will be hearing from me for about 1.5 hours, the most uh, is cannot be compared when you are facing uh, students of elementary or when you are facing students of high school. Uh, the things or the amount of knowledge that you can share to an elementary student is lesser than the amount of knowledge that you're going to share to a high school student. More so, the more you will give when you are already in college. That's about quantity. And everything that you're going to share to your students must be clear and they must also be organized. No, so you will see in my presentation how organized the lesson is because this leads to uh, full understanding if you are going to share new knowledge to your students that are that is organized. No. Then number two, knowledge can consist of facts, concepts, propositions, theories and perceptual data so all of this pertains to knowledge facts concepts propositions theories and perceptual data perceptual data can be in numbers or can be in text and the facts concepts propositions theories and perceptual data are all in the cognitive structure meaning they are all in the mind okay Meaningful learning takes place when an idea to be learned is related in some sensible way to ideas that the learner already possess. <coughs> so meaning, uh, the students will appreciate the lesson that you will be teaching them if the lesson that you are teaching now is connected to the previous knowledge. <coughs> so you will see that uh, in Education 2, how to facilitate learning, you are learning many theories. And of course, possible theory is connected to the theory of Gestalt, to the theory of uh, the first theories, the behavioral theories, and of course, the neo-behavioral theories. They are all connected to each other. <coughs> 
excuse me. So because they are connected, you will learn it meaningfully. And then the last one, the way to strengthen a student's cognitive structure is how? By using advanced organizers. <coughs> Do you know what advanced organizers are? So advanced organizers are proposed by Osebel. So Osebel, kumbaga, he is, he is a scientist that proposed advanced organizers. You will be seeing uh, organizers because organizers will give you uh, the bird's eye view or the big picture of the topic when they are organized. Because according to Osebel's theory, when the lesson is organized, it will be easily understood. So an advanced organizer can be a big help for learning. The use of advanced organizers, number one, one, derivative subsumption. What is derivative subsumption? This describes a situation in which the new information you learn is an example that you have already learned. So meaning, when you learn something today uh, that is connected to the past lesson, or as an example, say for example, we were discussing about theories, as I have told you before, and then we are again, today we are speaking about two theories, you, we call that as derivative subsumption because the lesson today is connected or assumed by the previous lessons. Number two, correlated subsumption. Example, that you have learned about the general characteristics of the verb. What is the general characteristic of the bird? The bird, of course, has feathers. Birds can fly. Those are the general characteristics. Now, you learn a kind of bird that has big body and strong legs, but it does not fly. That is called correlative subsumption. When you understand the concept today, and then uh, in the future, you will be learning another characteristics of that thing, so that is called correlative subsumption. Next, we have superordinate learning. Imagine a child well acquainted with fruit. Say, for example, uh, you have uh, your uh, siblings that are in the elementary or just uh, in the kindergarten. And then on your table, they have seen different kinds of fruits. They have seen apple, they have seen grapes, they have seen guava. But unless you teach what fruit is, they will never understand what a fruit is. They will just identify a fruit, but they don't understand the real essence of having fruits. We call that a superordinate learning. Until you teach what fruit is, they will thoroughly understand what fruit is. That fruit is very good for giving nutrients in the body. Uh, that fruit will uh, boost your immune system. That it will, it will help you not to have COVID-19. So those are some information about fruits. Not only the kindergarten will just see the fruit, but they will be learning the real essence and the meaning of fruit when you teach them what is it. Plus in mathematics, uh, of course, students will see numbers. They can easily identify numbers. But unless you teach them how to read numbers, how to add numbers, they will never understand that numbers can be added, that numbers can be subtracted. Number four is combinatorial learning. Combinatorial learning is previous knowledge is enriched through a new knowledge. Okay. Like what you are learning, the things that you have learned in the prelim will have a combinatorial learning in the midterm because they are all connected. Your previous knowledge in your prelim can be enriched by the knowledge that you will gain starting today in the midterm. Okay? Now, there are also types of graphic organizers. We have expository. Expository describes the new content. Narrative presents the new information in the form of a story. So when you, when you, especially in uh, those of you who are majoring mathematics, I am majoring in English, and you are going to tell a story, a narrative graphic organizer will 
help you. Now, I will show to you some examples later. Then, scheming, it is looking over the material to gain overview. So, a graphic organizer, can, we will have graphic organizers in the future so that before we discuss, you will have at least to scheme what will be discussed for about an hour. Then, we have also graphic organizers used to set up new information. Example of that are graphs. Example of that are maps. Uh, so these are called graphic organizers. So let us look if there is an example. So these are example of graphic organizers. So the first one, we have the basic outline. So this can be used when you do a, uh, a narrative. You know? When you do a narrative or present in a form of a story, you can use this outline graphic organizer then a venn diagram to look into the differences and similarities of concepts say for example i have discussed about possible's theory as well as uh, the gestalt psychology if i'm going to ask you to differentiate the two theories you can use venn diagram but there are because there are only two so you can use two circles but there if there are three you can use three Okay, say for example, we have discussed three uh, or four theories about behaviorist theory about Pablo, Tondike, and Watson. So you can use the Venn diagram. Uh, these are the differences. Uh, the connected part of the circle are the commonalities between the two. And the middle one is the connection or the similarity of the three. Okay, then we have also the so-called hierarchical, hierarchical, we have hierarchical topical organization. If you have the major topic here or the concept, then you have the sub-concept. So say, for example, our discussion today is about uh, uh, gestalt psychology. In here, you put gestalt here and there are three theorists. We have uh, Koffler, we have Wolfgang, and of course the other one. And then we can also make use of this one, the topical organizer. So there are still many uh, organizers that you can see, and you I know most of you have experienced using some of them, but uh, it's good to use them because uh, according to Osebel, they are very good tool so that students will be learning more from, uh, from the class if you are going to use graphic organizers. Okay? Share Subscribe, Jesus. Subscribe, share, share. Follow TV. Go, go, go.